people. Amen. Our God is faithful. Amen. As faithful as the ocean tide. He is faithful. Well, this is an exciting special morning, OK? Uh, we as a church have been praying for the last four weeks for one person that we feel that the Holy Spirit has laid upon our hearts that we deeply desire to see them come to faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Recognizing that it is God who saves, but he allows us to participate through the means of prayer and engaging them in conversation and just trying to pray for them and ask how they're doing. So at the conclusion of today's service, Hopefully, you uh, brought this back. If not, you can simply lift up your hand right now. We have ushers stationed around who will be more than happy to, to bring you one of these. Because at the conclusion of today's service, there's a perforated edge. We're going to tear this off. And we're just going to have a time of response where you come up and in an act of worship, you just place that in the box. Continue to pray, say a prayer over your one. But I want you to see what the Lord can do, what he promises to do when his people pray. OK? Also, this morning, we conclude our Every Spiritual Blessing series. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. As we have been walking through every spiritual blessing, Ephesians chapter 1, 3 through 14, Paul has outlined for us that in Christ, you and I have every spiritual blessing. Every spiritual blessing. And he has walked through one incredibly glorious, long, your English teacher would never let you get away with this. One incredibly long sentence from verse 3 all the way through 14. And we have spent seven weeks looking at this because there are six promises that are incorporated in this, OK? Uh, the first, that we have been chosen from the foundation of the world. That we have been adopted as sons and daughters of the king. And that he has redeemed us. And we looked at redemption. It's an incredibly specific word that talks about being bought out of slavery, either as a prisoner of war or a slavery. That the ransom price has been paid and we've been set free. Then on top of that, that he has revealed a purpose to us, that, uh, that all things converge at the feet of Christ, and that his kingdom has come, that everything is moving uh, towards uh, the culmination of every knee will bow. And so we have a purpose in that. And fifthly, that we have obtained an inheritance that awaits us in glory. And now this morning, the sixth it's actually the ultimate, the culmination of every spiritual blessing is the fact that we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Amen. Sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. As we watch how all these things converge together, we find out that the Holy Spirit has been working all along in your life and in my life to keep us in Christ. So listen, as I read... I'll reread verse 3. I'll summarize verses 4 through 12. And then we'll read 13 and 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. OK? Then verses 4 through 12, we've been chosen, adopted, redeemed. He's revealed a purpose. We've obtained an inheritance. And now listen to verse 13. In him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is a first installment of our inheritance in regard to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we are so honored to be able to meet together 
as your sons and daughters around your word to sing praise to your holy name, to know that your spirit comes and meets with us in a special, unique way when we all gather together. And Father, we, we declare right now that we are hungry for a word from you that we long to hear you, your voice in a special, intimate way this morning. Press deeply into our souls this truth that those of us that are in Christ have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, what it must have been like for the disciples of Christ to walk and talk with Jesus those three years. Can you imagine? To listen to him teach. After his teaching, to be able to ask him any question that you might have, to have him directly answer that. To hear his soft, tender voice, like a child who goes to a father with their every want, every groan, every agony, to hear his kind voice of comfort. Jesus, remind me again the prom how our father promises to provide for us. I, I know you've already told us before, but I just love to listen to you say it again. Now, when you and I think about that privileged position of the disciples, we often think about our own disadvantage. Why weren't we one of the lucky chosen ones to be able to walk and talk with him? John 16, verse 7 Jesus says, but I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I am leaving. For if I do not leave, the helper would not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. To your advantage. Amen. To quote J.D. Greer, he says, the Holy Spirit inside of you is better than Jesus beside you. You believe that? Amen. That we have the advantage, the sealing of the Holy Spirit of promise, that the sixth, every spiritual blessing is that God the Father has sent through the Son the helper and that you and I have been sealed by the indwelling Holy Spirit of promise that is inside each and every one of us. It is to our advantage. In fact, you will find as you study scripture that the Holy Spirit has been the enacting agent all along. When you first came to faith in Christ, Faith did not come by sitting, did it? Sitting in a church service? Nor did it come by seeing a miracle. Nor by kneeling before a relic or a priest. Nor by tasting of the bread and the wine. Nor by getting wet in the baptistry waters. No, 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 no. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. As Spurgeon said, not through the eye gate and not through the nose gate, but through the ear gate. That Catch this. When you first heard the gospel, when you were born again, when you became alive, the Holy Spirit was at work through your hearing and opened your deaf ears, began to stir in your heart in a unique, special way that can only be described as awakening you from the dead. And now that you are a believer, the scripture says you and I have been sealed, we are secure, and that he is our sixth every spiritual blessing. The Holy Spirit of promise. And I want you to watch how this works. I'm going to walk back through the first five every spiritual blessings, and I want us to look and see how the Holy Spirit enacts and is the acting agent all along to actually enable those previous every spiritual blessings. 
So remember with me the first three. The first three, every spiritual blessing is how they form our identity in Christ. Remember back, we, we preached full sermons on this. We, we dug deep down, but think with me. You have been chosen from the foundation of the world that you and I would stand holy and blameless before him. That God has predestined you and I to be adopted as sons and daughters in Christ. And that we have been redeemed, purchased. The ransom price paid. The fullness of the certificate of debt of our sin, not swept under a rug, not not amnesia and forgotten, but rather that God the Father looks directly at it and says, my son has paid the price in full. That we are redeemed. Guys, this is our identity in Christ Jesus. Have you ever wondered... Can I lose that identity? Can, what if I go through a season of doubt? Can I ever be unchosen? Can I disappoint God so much that he would no longer call me his child? Can I go through a period of being a prodigal where I sin myself back into being enslaved to sin, eternally separated from him? Have you ever wondered that? Listen to me. No, you can't ever lose your identity in Jesus Christ because you and I have been sealed as God's very own possession. As God's very own possession. You see, in the ancient world, just like in today's world, an owner would seal or brand, like a branding, those items that were his like the branding of a cattle, a unique mark signifying that this one is mine. Or have you ever gone to an amusement park and if you go with a large group and and you tell everyone you need to wear these bright yellow, just neon glowing shirts so that I can pick you out of the crowd wherever you go. The Holy Spirit is that for every believer. God's branding upon you, signifying this one is mine. In Revelation chapter 7, as the angels are about to bring judgment upon the earth, in this movement, God stops them and says, wait, 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 don't go yet. I need you to go and I need you to seal every believer on the forehead signifying that this one is mine. God's branding, God's choosing of us. And don't you for a second imagine that that branding is impersonal. For if you were to line up a million lookalikes of my children, could I not pick them out in an absolute instant in a lineup? That one is mine. Now, I need you to grasp this, this one magnificent truth, probably one of the greatest truths that you will ever conceive. Catch this. There are scriptures that detail how God is our portion. Okay? Lamentations 324, Psalm 73, 26. 26, God is our portion. But catch this. Did you know that the opposite is true? That we are God's portion, God's inheritance. That's what verse 14 says. A people for God's own possession. Think 
with me about this. This is absolutely mind-blowing. When you think about portion, what portion is supposed to be, I imagine sitting at a table and, and whatever is put on my plate is my portion. And God calls me not to look around at all the other plates, but rather to look at my own, to look at my own provision, okay? My wife is my portion and I am hers, She is the apple of my eye. She is my beauty. She is my affection. And and we are called to look rightly, not to be distracted by evil thoughts of the world to say, oh, 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 maybe I chose poorly, or oh, look at that over there, right? Rather, we are supposed to focus on our portion. Now, catch this, because you have to flip that around. The scripture teaches that we are God's portion. That he looks at us with 100% complete contentment and says, that one is mine. Not frantically worrying like, oh, I chose too soon. I didn't know he would turn out like that. I didn't know he would go, oh, I, 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 I chose unwisely. Rather, that God is 100% satisfied with you. And that he looks at you and that he longs for your affection. He has set his affection upon you. And he calls you his portion, his inheritance. That you satisfy and delight his heart. You are the joy of his possession forever. Forever. Sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise forever. Never to be revoked. That's magnificent. All right, think with me through Sorry, the fourth spiritual blessing, and let's see the Holy Spirit's impact. If you'll recall, the fourth spiritual blessing, that all of history is his story, that all things are converging to the very feet of Christ, and that understanding that his story is the giant momentum, not my own story. I find my identity and my own purpose in his story, in the kingdom adventure that's going forward. I find all my purpose in that. Now catch this. The Holy Spirit has promised to empower us on our mission all of our days. Do you know the difference between D-Day and Victory in Europe Day? Think back to World War II. D-Day is the day that the Allied forces stormed the beaches of Normandy, June 6, 1944. D-Day was the day that they, uh, winning a decisive battle, the decisive battle, uh, giving the fatal wound was struck in the victory of D-Day. But it would be another 11 months before Germany would surrender unconditionally to the Allied forces on May 8th, 1945, what we call Victory in Europe Day. D-Day and Victory in Europe Day. Church, you and I are living between D-Day and Victory Day. That D-Day, the decisive battle, was won when Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sin and was resurrected. And he now sits at the Father's right hand. But the battle is still fierce and bloody, and there are still great casualties as we await his ultimate coming in victory. That we live in this interim, and that in this interim, we find our purpose. But listen, the Holy Spirit has promised you and I power and victory, the ability to walk through, that he has not left us orphaned, but rather we have the power in the middle of the darkness of life. The Holy Spirit is our light, leading and lighting our path. 
How many times have you looked back at the circumstances of your life, been able to look back and seen the loving, kind, moving hand of the Holy Spirit and said, only God, only God could have orchestrated that. Where would I be but for him? In the middle of that trial, I didn't see exactly how he was moving. I didn't know how it was going to turn out, but I look back and declare, only God. That's what it's like to live in between D-Day and Victory and Europe Day. I rewrote this section of the sermon about three times this week until I finally settled because I genuinely feel the Lord wanted me to share this next story with you. You guys probably recall back in November, there was a series of personal events in my own life where a very dear friend of mine died and then the next day my father died. What I hadn't shared was some of the details where I could now in hindsight look back and see the incredible hand of the Holy Spirit. Lane and I were out for our anniversary. It was a Sunday night, and we got a phone call that said from Drexel's wife declaring that he was going down really fast. It came as a shock to us because I just, I had been on the phone with him earlier that week, and he sounded okay. When we got the news, Lane and I began to talk about what we needed to do in response to that. To be honest, I didn't think he was going down that fast. And I'm always busy. Busy, busy, busy. So Lane and I talked about it that night, and we decided we weren't going to go to Plainview, weren't going to drive back. In the middle of the night, I woke up with a restlessness. Let me just be honest. It's confusing in the middle of the moment, this restlessness, this lack of peace. And all I could think about was Drexel. Got up, spent some time in prayer, was still just kind of unsure, but Lane walked in and and, and she said, what's going on? And I just said, "I, I just don't have a sense of peace about not going to see Drexel. She said, if you don't have peace, let's go. And so Monday, we we drove to Plainview, got there in the evening. I was able to be there for the last moments and hours that Drexel was actually able to speak because by Tuesday morning, he wasn't able to speak anymore. And we drove back to Plainview. Sorry, we drove back here to Bernie. Let me just tell you, I cried that entire trip home. It was a a letting go, a process, a a grieving and dealing with a very close friend and his death. He died on Wednesday. My father would die on Thursday. Through that incredible whirlwind, All I can say is how kind and strength-filling and encouraging the Holy Spirit was. That he used your prayers. That he gave me a strength that I didn't know where it came from. That I was able to preach both funerals And stand there before a congregation and declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when I look back and I ask myself, who am I? Who am I that you would use me to stand before people to declare the good news of Jesus Christ? And in such powerful moments in death. I look back. And I just pause and say, thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I don't know why he wanted me to share that with you this morning, except to describe that life is full of trials. Life is full of crisis. And in those moments, we don't always know exactly how things are working out. But we are able to look back 
and say, if it weren't for God, if it weren't for the Holy Spirit moving and working and using incredible times of prayer, and how did he give me the strength? How did he give me the words? How did he get me through that? As we live between D-Day and Victory Day, were it not for Christ, were it not for his Holy Spirit, listen, he promises to lead us, to comfort us, to give us wisdom, to even pray for us whenever we don't know how to pray. This is the Holy Spirit of promise. Finally, think with me about the fifth blessing that we've obtained, that we have obtained an inheritance that awaits for us, that lasting, real treasure, eternal treasure that will not fade away, will not rust, thieves cannot destroy, awaits for us in heaven. And the Holy Spirit is as this scripture says, the pledge of our inheritance. The pledge of our inheritance. Think with me about those times when you are incredibly hot, incredibly sweaty, you've worked your body temperature up really high, and then you take that first cold drink of water. Woo! I took a church a couple years back on a mission trip down to uh, Harlingen, where we were working with uh, another church down there. And, and we had plans uh, to work indoors, uh, but all those plans fell through. And you know how you go on any mission trip, you better be adjustable. And we ended up putting a roof upon a church in the middle of July <laughs> in the Rio Grande Valley. It got so hot up there, my shoes melted to the roof. But I remember coming down, famished, and you grab a cold bottle of water, and you start to drink. You can feel it go down, right? You can feel it start to permeate as it goes down. Listen to me. The scripture says that the Holy Spirit is that first drink of cold water. He is the first taste, the foretaste of your inheritance that awaits you and I in heaven. That when we have those moments where we can look back in our life and we can say, were it not for the Holy Spirit of God, that taste, that comfort, that assurance, those tender moments cause us to look forward towards our inheritance and say, what is it going to be like when it's all like that? What is it going to be like when he fixes me and it's all like that? Listen, he is that first taste, those first fruits that cause us to long for the victory that is coming. Now, I need you to notice, not only is the Holy Spirit a foretaste of our coming inheritance, he is also the protection and the guarantee. Like the sealing of a letter by a king. In the ancient world, the way that you protected a letter, the way that you protected a message is you would roll up the scroll, you would put a blot of hot wax, and then the king would take his signet ring and seal it. And that would cover the letter because it could not be opened because no one else had the signet ring or the seal of the king. And no one would dare open that letter because it was punishable by death if you ever open or doctored with. And so it would go to its recipient and then that recipient would see the seal broken. Listen to me. That's your Holy Spirit of promise. The guarantee, the protector that you will make it all the way until victory day, that you will make it all the way until the end, that that seal will stay, that it will not be open because who would dare open punishable by the king. Listen to me. It's an incredible truth. 
Jesus in John 10, 28 and 29, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. It is not you holding on to Christ. It's Christ holding on to you. For I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it, perfect it, until the day of Christ Jesus. Our inheritance is guaranteed. The down payment has been made, and God the Father is not a delinquent payer. He has put down his earnest money and he will fulfill his promise. Listen, why is that so important? So that you and I as believers in Christ rest. So that we rest in his promises. It reminds me of of an older Superman movie. An older Superman movie, there was, there was a man who was rescued from the top floor of a burning building. And Superman grabbed him, and he's flying him to safety. And along the way, the man looks down, sees the tremendous height, and begins to be filled with fear. And begins to tremble, and begins to say to Superman, I'm afraid you're going to drop me from such heights. To which Superman aptly replied, if I saved you from a burning building, what, make, what makes you think I'm going to drop you on the way down? Church, listen to me. If your God and Father sent his son while you were his enemy, while you were seared and smoked by the hellfire and flame of the consequences of your sin, And Jesus Christ came and saved you in the middle of that situation. What makes you think he's going to drop you on the way down? You are not holding on to him. He is holding on to you. Are you in Christ? He is holding on to you. Listen to me. Rest, believer. Rest. You have every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Rest in him. Every spiritual blessing, all that you could ever ask or think, is yours in Jesus Christ. One of my favorite Disney movies of all time is The Lion King. Simba is the glorious son of Mufasa, made in his image a rightful heir. But Scar is the deceiving, bitter uncle who tricks Simba into making poor decisions, and it ends up killing Mufasa, Simba's father, causing Simba to run away in shame. In that pain, And in that shame, he runs away and he hides from who he was made to be. Now, Simba befriends a warthog and some sort of ferret-like creature that teach him to eat grub worms and sing happy songs. Hakuna Matata. And just sing happy songs and eat grub worms. And then you'll just be fine. A lion eating grub worms and singing happy songs. But everything ultimately comes to a crisis point because there is a call back to Simba to remember who he is and to reclaim his rightful throne. It's a crisis moment in Simba's life. He doesn't know what to do. He's so confused internally. And he goes out, he gets by himself, and he begins to talk, and he has this vision where he sees his father in the clouds. And in that moment, his father whispers to him over and over and over again, remember who you are. Remember who you are. And he goes back 
and he reclaims his rightful throne because he remembers who he is. Church, I need you to listen to me. God the Father made you in his image. And he made you a rightful heir, a son and a daughter of the king. But you and I have sinned. We have been deceived and we have sinned and we have fallen short of the glory of God. And we have an enemy who prowls around like a roaring lion and accuses us and causes us to hide in our shame day and night, never wanting to reclaim our rightful place for who we actually are. But Jesus Christ... Jesus Christ died on the cross, taking all the punishment for our sin, and he has redeemed us. He has made us in his image. Uh, He has given us every spiritual blessing. He has given that to us, that we have been chosen from the foundation of the world, that we have been adopted as sons and daughters of the king, that we have been redeemed, that he has revealed to us uh, our purpose and that we have obtained an inheritance and that we have been sealed in the Holy Spirit of promise, that all things are ours in Jesus Christ. Are you guys with me this morning? I'm about to start preaching, all right? That we have every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. So listen to me. When Satan comes to you and begins to shame you for the sins of your past, you need to remember who you are. Whenever you think that your life is meaningless and that you do not have plans for a future, that God has abandoned you, that he has left you, listen to me. You need to remember who you are. Whenever the world begins to come against you, Whenever you have trials and tribulations that you do not think you will endure, that you do not think you will be able to last through the end, you need to remember who you are. Listen to me. You have every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. And scripture calls you and I right now to remember who we are. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, as your sons and daughters who are gathered here, teach us to remember who we are. The promises that you have given unto us, the promises that are true, We confess to you how often we are shaken, how often we are discouraged, how often we are shamed, how often we are confused because we don't feel like we are holding on to you tight enough, how often we are distracted and clinging to the things of this world. Father, may the truth of your word wash over your people. May you teach us again your promises that we have every spiritual blessing in Christ. Teach us to walk. Help us, Father. By the power of the Holy Spirit, help us. Renew our minds. We want to walk worthy of you. We want to walk worthy of you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.